It's just so wonderful to be with you, Dr. Lemke. Dr. Lemke is a professor uh, and, uh, of psychiatry and addiction medicine at Stanford University. In 2016, you published a book, Drug, Deal Drug Dealer MD, yes. that's right, yes. where you gave a very uh, um, lucid explanation of how it is that we came to the opioid epidemic that we're dealing with right now. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I have all of, all of your papers uh, in a file on my desktop on my computer, and this is the actual file. Uh, I keep a file of the people that, that, whose work has really moved me. Um, George Coop has a file with kittens on it. You didn't get the ones with kittens on it. But one of the, one of the rewards of recovery is you get to meet your heroes. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a big day for me. So, and I thank you very much for being here. Um, congratulations on your new book, Dopamine Nation. The minute it, it, uh, it came to the door of the Amazon package, I tore it open and had read it before the sun went down for the most part. Wow. And you've really described very beautifully, I think, the experience of your patients you. in, a, in a compassionate way. Um, I first heard your voice when I was driving to pick my wife up, um, at the time we were living in Honolulu and I was driving down the Kalani Ana Ole Highway and uh, you were interviewed by Terry Gross on NPR about your book uh, that came out in 2016. And um, I was so struck, not only by the clarity of your answers about some very difficult and still quite unresolved problems in addiction medicine, but the tremendous authenticity and compassion that you had um, for your for your patients that you described, um, I think uh, what really struck me was was the forthrightness of your answers that you said that you had given to your patients, um, and I think that that's something very very hard to do uh, to be able to to uh, confront a patient at a time when their defenses are crashing down to be able to preserve their dignity in that moment and give them the straight answer uh, and yet come away with that with a stronger bond mm -hmm. between doctor and mm -hmm. patient. Mm -hmm. that, that is truly um, magical. And uh, that's what Bill Wilson and Dr. Silkworth had, mm -hmm. uh, that connection. That's what I had with my psychiatrist, Dr. John Milner. Uh, he passed away about a year ago. Uh, he was one of the original ASAM doctors uh, all the way back at their first meeting. Um, that's what I'd like to think that we provide our patient, Dr. Caldwell and uh, Dr. Wolfs and all of our doctors, Dr. Lee uh, in Texas um, uh, and Drs. Campa and Sutcher in Malibu, um, to be able to uh, tell a person something that they they find very painful and yet do it in a way that's compassionate is, is really the entire talent, I think, of, of addiction medicine. And so, um, you know, addiction is a very powerful disease, and I'm sure you'll agree. Um, people with addiction have a lot of power in their rage and the power of their denial and the flawless logic of their denial. Anyone who's ever tried to block an AMA uh, uh, from treatment or, or do an intervention knows this. Um, your ability to speak truth to power, I think, is what makes you one of the most important voices that we have in the middle of this absolutely historical, you know, uh, opioid epidemic, okay. the clarity. Um, and you did all of this over the radio, <laughs> which I found so amazing. So you have to imagine me sitting in the parking lot of the food land in Ina Heine, just, just I could not tear myself away. My wife was waiting. Uh, and then I cr listened to the interview a couple more times that evening, and I've, I've, I've not been able to, to, um, to stop listening to what you had to say. Um, so we all have a kind of vision of what we want our addiction physician to look like. Um, I would consider that sort of a platonic ideal. Uh, and that's what you are for me. And I, I think I've actually put together some of your statements that, uh, that I, th I think, you know, this is what I say in my mind. If I, if I don't know what to say, I turn to your words. And I think those words go like this. You know, it's important that you stop drinking. It's important that you stop using drugs. It's bad for your health. And I believe you can do it. And I will be with you along the way as you try. And I, I think that, that I stole those words from you, and I think they really state things very quickly. So congratulations on your new book. What, uh, how's it gone so far? 
uh, since it's been released just a couple days now. Yeah, <laughs> um, so it was uh, released last week and um, I was really very nervous about it for a number of different reasons. Um, a lot of my messages in the book are somewhat countercultural, and also I disclose um, some very personal things in the book that I was um, kind of nervous to do. Um, but so far, the, by and large, the reaction has been positive, and so that's been uh, really gratifying. And I really wrote the book um, hoping that it would be helpful to people, that it would be helpful to patients, that it would be helpful to providers, that it would be helpful to parents, um, and that it would s shift, shift the conversation a little bit around addiction. I think that's what I was hoping for, too, to kind of shift that conversation a little bit. Well, you've, you've done that. Uh, you know, I, we had talked just before we uh, started here that um, people with addiction, they can kind of smell BS. And, uh, and a lot of wonderful, wonderful addiction physicians have tried to connect with their patients by describing their own experiences with what, you know, are kind of like addiction, you know, buying too many things or, or having something like that. You, you thread that needle beautifully and skillfully when you disclose, you know, your own struggles. Um, I think it comes off in a very uh, authentic and, and honest way. And that's a major theme in your book, is, is honesty. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about radical honesty? Sure. Can people hear me okay? I, okay, great. Um, well, one of the things that really started to intrigue me um, in my work with patients with addiction over the last 20 plus years is how much telling the truth about things large and small um, seemed to play an outsized role in their recovery. And um, I got really curious about that from a, like a neuroscientific perspective, um, from a philosophical perspective, and also just started to wonder about you know, the role of honesty in my own life. Um, because I have been, um, you know, I have had moments of significant dishonesty in my life and a lot of regret around that. I grew up in a family with quite a bit of dishonesty, um, so was not acculturated, uh, you know, to tell the truth. And so I became really intrigued by this phenomenon and, and, and w what it meant for not just recovery, but a life well lived. Uh, to the point where, fast forward, I now actually prescribe honesty uh, to patients. So, you know, when I give them direction um, in the early stages of recovery, um, sometimes that involves um, writing a prescription. It certainly involves, um, you know, a period of, of a trial of abstinence from their drug of choice, and it also involves a prescription for radical honesty. Try really hard in this next month to not tell a lie about anything at all. Um, and I say to them, that's because I've discovered that that's a really important piece of being able to stay sober or to get into and um, maintain recovery. So what I try to do in the book is really kind of break down, like what is it about telling the truth that is so fundamental to this process of recovery? Um, yeah, and so that, that's, that's what that chapter is about. Yeah, yeah may, if I may, just read some yes, of your please. words. Radical honesty, telling the truth about things, large and small, especially when doing so exposes our foibles and entails consequences, is essential not just to recovery from addiction, but for all of us trying to live a more balanced life in our reward-saturated ecosystem. It's... Um, you also in your appearance in the social um, dilemma. dilemma, sorry, <laughs> you, you talk a little bit about drugified um, things like social media mm -hmm. and their connection to the dopamine system. What, what's your, what are your favorite uh, um, comments or lines, you know, things that, that are said about dopamine? How do you see dopamine? Uh, how would you define dopamine and its role? You mean dopamine more broadly in its function in, yeah, in the like, brain? Yeah, like if you were to say, if someone were to say, well, addiction's all about dopamine, how would you, um, what role does dopamine have when I have a pleasurable experience? Right. So, um, you know, what I say to patients and to medical students to try to help them understand the neuroscience, the basic neuroscience of addiction is, 
um, that dopamine is a neurotransmitter in our brain that is very important for the experience of pleasure, reward, and motivation. It's not the only neurotransmitter involved in that process, but it's probably the most important one and also probably the final common pathway. And that the fundamental distinction between things that are addictive and those that are not is that things that are addictive release a lot of dopamine all at once. Um, the other thing that I talk about with patients and with medical students is I, I like to use this metaphor of the balance. So I say imagine that in your brain, in that part of your brain that we call the reward pathway, there is a balance. Um, and when that balance tips one way, we experience pleasure, and when it tips the opposite direction, we experience pain. Um, and the reason that that metaphor is useful for understanding the neuroscience of pleasure and pain is because one of the interesting discoveries in neuroscience in the last 75 years is that pleasure and pain in the brain are co-located, by which I mean that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain, which I think is really fascinating. And that pleasure and pain do work like opposite sides of a balance. So for example, um, when I eat a piece of chocolate, I get a little release of dopamine in my brain's uh, pleasure, pleasure centers, right? And my balance tips slightly to the side of pleasure. But one of the fundamental rules governing this balance is that it wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long to the side of pleasure or the side of pain. So no sooner have I eaten that piece of chocolate then my brain will try to regulate that experience by down-regulating my own dopamine production and my own dopamine transmission. And I happen to imagine that uh, as these little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. And those gremlins represent something that uh, scientists call neuroadaptation. But the thing about those gremlins is that they really like it on the balance. So they don't hop off as soon as the balance is level. They stay on until the balance is tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And that's what's called the opponent process reaction, but is experienced as the come down or the hangover or the after effect. Now, if I wait long enough, those gremlins hop off the pain side of the balance and homeostasis or a level balance is restored. But if I don't wait, if I continue to ingest that substance repeatedly over a long period of time, what ends up happening is I have so many gremlins on the pain side of my balance that I essentially reset my pleasure pain pathway. And those gremlins, they will camp out there right? So they, they bring their tents and their barbecues and kind of, you know, make it their second home. So that means now I've really reset my hedonic or joy threshold so that I'm, when I'm not using my substance, I'm essentially walking around in a state of dysphoria, irritability, anxiety, restlessness, and I need to use my substance at a certain point not to feel good, but just to restore homeostasis and just to feel normal again. And for me, understanding this neuroscience was really important to understanding why it is that people, even after long periods of recovery and abstinence, even after everything or many things are so much better in their lives, why they would relapse. Because that was as somebody without the disease of severe addiction, I certainly have my minor addictions. It was hard for me to understand that, but once I came to really appreciate the neuroscience and that people with severe addiction when they're not using are walking around with a balance tilted to the side of pain, uh, it, really, it really allowed me to um, access deep compassion uh, for this problem. So, so that's what I talk about when I teach medical students. That's what I talk about when I teach patients. And I just find that when patients learn about how they're in a dopamine deficit state because of their chronic heavy drug use, and that's why craving happens, and that's why it's really on some level out of their voluntary control, it can be empowering for them to understand
um, to understand that piece. Actually, I I was on, I don't know if you know this, but I was on Terry Gross last week for my, my new book. Okay. And I got one of the best things about going on these shows is I get these wonderful emails from people all over who have heard the show. And I got this one really short, really touching email from a, a listener who said, um, you know, this is so silly. I'm trying to quit smoking. He said, he said, this is so silly. I'm trying to quit smoking. It's been really hard. But now when I'm feeling a craving for a cigarette, I just imagine those gremlins on the pain side of my balance and it makes it so much easier for me. So that was like really super gratifying to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know, it's, um, I think it was about 10 years ago, I think Mark Potenza published a paper that said that we really need to kind of carve addiction at different joints. And it was a paper that really invited people to think about addiction from the perspective of the dopamine hypothesis and not just see intoxicants as the big ones, you know, heroin, uh, cocaine, things like that, but to really look at the behaviors uh, that can be addictive. Obviously, you know, uh, gambling disorder was reclassified, um, but to really look at some things on the periphery um, that all of us engage in, things like like social media or, or video games. Uh, this is, I would say, um, you know, quite provocative. Can, can you tell me, you list three things that make something addictive. What were those three things? Yeah, so I talk about the importance of quantity, potency, and novelty as really at the heart of things that are addictive. And I think that that those three criteria are especially pertinent for the times that we live in now in which almost everything has become drugified, making us all at different threshold levels vulnerable to the problem of addiction. So for example, if you just think about uh, our, our phones or social media or pornography or video games, um, and you think about quantity, um, it's, I mean, even cocaine at some point, unless you own and run the cartel, you're going to run out, right? And then you're going to have to get some money and get some more. But that is not true for social media. That is not true for pornography and other online digital products. There is literally an infinite amount. Um, and that has really totally transformed the addictive potential uh, of 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 those kinds of drugs, also potency is is a key piece and speaks in particular to the way that technology has transformed our vulnerability to addiction. Opioids are a great example. So in the early 1800s, morphine was isolated for the first time from opium. Opium comes directly from the poppy plant, and morphine is about 10 times stronger than opium. Then in the mid-1800s, the hypodermic syringe was invented, and the hypodermic syringe was thought to be a way to administer morphine to individuals and thereby protect them from becoming addicted to the morphine. Well, not surprisingly, the opposite happened, and we ended up with a whole bunch of iatrogenic morphine addiction in the late 1800s, which is why then Bayer Aspirin, through further technological innovation in the laboratory, synthesized a new opioid that was going to have all of the wonderful properties of morphine and opium, but not have that addictive potential. And that wonderful new molecule, they, they named um, heroic, or heroish in German, and we know that molecule as heroin. Fast forward all the way to the present day, doctors can now literally prescribe fentanyl lollipops. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. So it's that change in technology, you know, for good and bad, but really when it comes to our vulnerability to addiction, we've really transformed it. And then we see also with the digital devices, and I talk about how the smartphone has essentially become the equivalent of the hypodermic syringe, delivering this digital dopamine 24 seven, making it very difficult uh, to control, um, control our you know, our vulnerability. The last piece is novelty, and I think the novelty aspect is really uh, particularly insidious with digital products, because what happens online is that these algorithms um, essentially um, learn us and know what we've 
done before. Um, you know, they know our digital blueprint, and then they, then they essentially proffer up to us as triggers. Um, you know, what is the next thing that that we would like to do? Which also then enlists our sort of treasure hunting functions. You know, our sort of search and discover functions, which is again a natural healthy, adaptive piece of our brains, but when it gets engaged with YouTube videos or social media or video games, it's we keep searching for that next thing that is very close to the thing that we just did that we liked, but it's going to be just a tiny little bit different. It's not dissimilar at all to adding like a little chemical change to, you know, an opioid to make it a little bit more potent. I remember learning the basics of operant conditioning when I was a psychology major at Davis, and uh, I was always fascinated by the idea of a variable reinforcement schedule, that if you give an animal the opportunity to press a lever for a reward like cocaine, um, he'll you know, press it quite avidly, but it's when you vary the schedule, like sometimes he gets it, sometimes he doesn't, sometimes he has to press it five times to get one, that's when the reinforcement is much, much more powerful, a big quantum leap in the ability of a reward to be reinforcing. And you write in your book um, that social media apps where the response of others is so capricious and unpredictable that the uncertainty of getting a like is as re reinforcing as the like itself. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so it speaks to a couple things. First of all, one of the things that I find fascinating about um, these digital products is the way that enumerating them or giving them a number has made them um, more addictive, which is interesting in and of itself. So um, by, for example, being able to like something and get a number of likes makes that interaction online more addictive for us. Um, when we're playing video games, I know that the ranking um, is incredibly alluring for people, the desire to move up in their rankings to get to rank number one. So the, the, giving these things a number becomes literally like a monetary currency. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, there's some very interesting work looking at people with gambling addiction and dopamine levels. And one of the uh, fascinating things that that I learned about is that if you take somebody who uh, is not addicted to gambling and you assess their dopamine levels um, when they're winning and you compare it to um, somebody who has a gambling addiction and you look at their dopamine levels, what you'll find is that the person who is just gambling recreationally has a big dopamine release when they win, similar to um, a person who has a gambling addiction. But the distinction between those individuals in terms of their dopamine reaction comes when they're losing. For a person with gambling addiction, they actually have higher dope or as high dopamine release in their brains when they're losing as when they're winning. And this has been called loss chasing. And in fact, the dopamine levels are highest for people with gambling addiction when the risk of winning and the risk of losing are exactly equal. So when there's peak uncertainty, there's peak dopamine. That's fascinating. And it certainly speaks to the ability of people to create reinforcement schedules yes. in, in things like video games. And you think, well, it's just a video game. I just, I killed that zombie. What's the <laughs> harm, right? right? But it's the, it's the subtlety of mm. the delivery. It's the the subtlety of the schedule of the, ske of the reinforcement, the schedule of the reinforcement, and also things like artificial intelligence can kind of figure out how it is that we uh, like delivery of, of reinforceable things, like things that come over the phone. Right, which reminds me to say that another aspect of making a drug more potent is to, to combine two drugs. So for example, people who use opioids know that if they combine that with benzodiazepines, they can overcome tolerance, augment the high. And of course, it becomes riskier as well, right? Because we know that combination increases the risk of overdose. It's the same exact thing with these digital products. So you already take this immersive, creative landscape, which is in and of itself a highly reinforcing game. And then you add to that gambling. Right, so they have these treasure chests. Um, there, there's basically built into the video game the aspect of gambling. So it takes two drugs and it makes them, um, you know, together more potent than any one drug by itself. And then you add to that the rankings, and that adds to the potency as well.
That's interesting. So how do I fix all of this? A person, I come into your office, um, I'm about to lose my job because I'm spending too much time on video games or the phone. Uh, I, I think what's so interesting is that so many patients with addiction, they don't know what's happening. They have all of these bodily symptoms. Everything just seems so crazy, but they don't necessarily make the connection. I mean, if it was heroin, that'd be one thing, but they don't really see how all of these things are coming together to produce this, this disease. So, so what's the solution? How do I fix it? What would you recommend? Well, I mean, it's not as if I have, you know, a magic solution or do anything different from, you know, what you all do or what's what's generally recommended. But I I do have a kind of early intervention that I've evolved for my outpatient ambulatory care clinic, which um, in which we have quite a few people who are not in a place where they either recognize that they have a problem or are interested in doing anything about it. And and that intervention is essentially, well, I have an acronym, dopamine, in the book, but it's essentially um, a kind of a practical experiment that I ask patients to engage in. And I really do talk about it as an experiment. I essentially first, the, the D of dopamine stands for data. I first say, well, let's tell me how much you're using, what you're using, how often, in what circumstances. And of course, we all know that just by telling another human being out loud what we're actually doing brings it into relief in a way that doesn't necessarily happen if we're just having it pinging around in our own heads. And then the O for dopamine stands for um, objectives. So I'm sure you all do this in your work too, trying to explore in a compassionate way with the patient why they use. Because even highly irrational behavior has its own rationality. So getting, learning with them what is good about use. The P of the dopamine as, uh, acronym stands for problems related to use. That's where I get try to get them to say out loud, well, what's not working out for you? And sometimes the only piece of that is that, you know, they're parents are angry with them and made them see me, which is a problem for them, right? That may be the only thing they identify. And then the A, and this is really the main intervention, is where I ask them for four weeks of abstinence from their drug of choice. Now, of course, there are caveats to this. I would not ask somebody who's physically dependent on benzos or opioids or alcohol to just stop cold turkey. But many of our patients are not at that level and can do that. And I do this same intervention with people who are addicted to sex. I, I ask them for no orgasms with themselves or others for one month. Um, people who are addicted to gambling, people who are addicted to video games, whatever it is, I ask them to put it away for a month and I explain the pleasure pain balance and I warn them that in the first two weeks they're going to feel worse before they feel better because they will have a pleasure pain balance tipped to the side of pain. They'll be in a dopamine deficit state. They will experience the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and craving. But importantly, that is not what they will be left with. That is withdrawal-mediated dysphoria. And that's especially important for our patients who are dual diagnosis or come in specifically seeking help for anxiety and depression and believe that their substance is actually relieving those symptoms. Why would you take this away from me when it's the only thing that makes me feel better? And this is where we really have to explain the balance and say, you know what? In the short run, you actually will have more of these symptoms that you came to me looking for help with. But if you can make it to four weeks, there's a very good chance you'll start to feel better. And if you don't feel better at four weeks, that is also important data because it tells me that it's not primarily driven by the problem of your substance use, but that you, that you really do have this underlying anxiety, depressive disorder, whatever it is. I have personally, I know this is not necessarily, you know, what what is being taught um, around how to handle dual diagnosis, but I have personally found this to be extraordinarily helpful in my patient population to try to elucidate out what piece of this is the substance use and what piece of it is your co-occurring mental health disorder. And most of the time, there's some combination there. It's almost never, oh, it was all your substance use and it, you don't have a, you know, an anxiety disorder. But, but 
but the extent to which it is the substance use is illuminating, I think, for people. And so this exercise of abstinence can shed light on that, even if ultimately that person is a dual diagnosis and needs integrated treatment, with which most of our patients do. You, you talk about one of your patients very movingly and his struggles with, with craving. Um, I've always believed that that's the, the ability to at least uh, have some empathy for craving is really what, what is the threshold of a person's understanding of addiction. Um, I tried to describe it in, in my movie. It kind of came off a little silly. Not but But people <laughs> often t tell me, you know, that really is how it feels. Mm -hmm. And and you um, describe this particular piece of advice, which always makes me cringe. I certainly cringed when I first heard it. Um, but there was a time when I was in my early sobriety and I absolutely had to stay sober. My entire medical career was on the line. Uh, and I had just discovered access to cocaine. And that's always been my problem. I, there are people who can walk into a bar and say, that guy's got the cocaine. I've never been able to do that. I just, I have absolutely no idea. In fact, that's a large part of what keeps me sober, or at least it did then. But I had found somebody that would sell me cocaine. And you, you write uh, in, your, um, in your book the, this advice, and this is why I just I couldn't stand getting this advice. Get down on your knees and pray for some relief. And I have to say, you know, I did that. I was so desperate that I, all right, let's try it. And I felt completely, it's been a long time since I went to Christian camp up in the Sierras, but, uh, but you know, that was probably the last time. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm creeped out by that, quite frankly. <laughs> can, you tell me, can you tell me a little bit more about, uh, about you know, that recommendation? Yeah, so the, the patient, you know, in whom I recommended that was somebody who was raised Catholic. So he had this familiarity with, um, with religious traditions and with a tradition of prayer that involved certain rituals. So it wasn't that far afield from his own, his own experience. But, you know, anybody who's worked with, um, you know, addiction and recovery knows that the spiritual transformation can be an absolutely fundamental component of healing and recovery for many individuals. And obviously the 12 steps, um, you know, say that explicitly, that it is the spiritual transformation and handing it over uh, to a higher power that's, that's so key. I, something that I wanted to write about in this book, but I, I wasn't able to, but maybe there's a, another book to follow, is what is that spiritual transformation? Like what, what happens, you know, what, what is going on in the brain, um, if we're going to look at it from a reductionistic point of view, um, that makes that such a powerful thing? Because it is, um, it is kind of mind-blowing, you know, how that kind of giving it over and that surrender um, becomes just such an important part of, of recovery. So I, I, I think I have more questions than I have answers, but I certainly believe in the spiritual transformation and, and in faith-based faith pathways. And, um, you know, in, in, I will say in Western medicine, um, there's, there are probably a couple four-letter words, and one of them is God. Um, we are not supposed to, as healthcare professionals, really talk about God and, and talk about spirituality. Um, I remember I had a colleague um, contact me and say one of her patients who was Jewish really wanted to ask her about um, recovery through his faith, and she felt as a medical doctor she couldn't even talk about it because it was just sort of, there was an unspoken sort of barrier there that we're not supposed to do that. But one of the things that I've learned from my patients, and this book really is about what I've learned from my patients, um, as well as the neuroscience, is that it's so important to talk about that, to talk about God, however people conceptualize that, to ask them about their faith and their spiritual traditions and what they've tried and whether or not it's been helpful. So I always bring it into the conversation now. I was very lucky. One of my well, my first sponsor was a, an Orange County Superior Court judge who was in retired. He's, he's long dead now. Um, and I was really struggling with this whole religion thing. It just, it did not make sense to me as a physician that you had to, if you wanted to get better from a disease, that you had to become religious. 
and uh, and find God. And he he knew exactly what to say with me. This is just I think the magic of AA is the right person comes along at just the right moment and says things with just the right words that you can hear it. And he said, you don't have to find God to get sober, but you do have to look. Um, and that was nice. sort of, it sh- <laughs> just turned it right around on me. And in, in, a, in a fraction of a second, yeah. all of that prejudice, mm. that defense mm-hmm. came crashing down mm-hmm. um, because it really was about, you know, and I clung to that quote in the yeah. back of the big book that says, you know, it's, it's contempt prior to investigation mm-hmm. that will keep us from going. And so I, I just I tried to kind of make myself open. It didn't happen. Mm. I didn't have a conversion. I moved to Utah and I was absolutely <laughs> ready. <laughs> no one came by my front door. It was very insulting. Um, but uh, I'm like, what's wrong with me? I think they figured out, you know what, that Macaulay guy, don't even bother. There's just no way we're going to be able to you know, make the temple catch on fire if we let him in. Um, but uh, it, it, was just, it was just interesting. You know, you, you take on one of the great shibboleths uh, of all of psychiatry, this is about 10 years ago that you published your paper um, taking on the self-medication hypothesis mm-hmm. that was developed one, by one of the giants of psychoanalysis, Edward Kantian. The idea, and you, you, you break it down um, into these three postulates, so the, the causation postulate that drug use is caused because a person has a psychiatric, psychiatric disorder. Mm-hmm. Uh, the specificity poly- postulate that people choose certain drugs because they're trying to self-medicate that particular kind mm-hmm. uh, of psychiatric disorder. And then the treatment postulate that is that says if you simply treat the psychiatric disorder, then the drug use mm-hmm. will stop. Mm-hmm. And you you just argue extremely convincingly and and I think the words that you used here were um, that the self-medication hypothesis should be abandoned because it impedes the recognition of addiction, mm-hmm. um, but it also disallows patients, it allows patients to deny the negative impact of their addiction rather than encourage behavior change. Can you tell me a little bit about what the reception to that paper was like? Yeah, it's been, well, it's, let me just say I've softened my stance on that a little bit since I wrote that paper. So I, w- I was quite a bit younger. And I think what that paper really came from a place of recognition that psychiatrists were um, undermining um, people's ability to make progress in their lives because we were wholly ignoring the problem of substance use. And by the way, I, I would include myself in, in, in that group. And I've talked openly about how early in my career, I could discuss every single conversation my patient ever had with their mother, but I would never ask them a simple question about whether or not they were using substances. And that's in part because I, I didn't get any training in medical school. That was my own countertransference toward patients with substance use problems, my own lack of knowledge for how to help them if, God forbid, you know, they actually told me they had a problem with substances. I, I wouldn't have known what to do. Um, and it was this realization that, that patients were coming in and attributing their substance use entirely to self-medication. And in doing so, so operationally how that was playing out in the in a psychiatrist's office is that together then the patient and the psychiatrist could just completely ignore the substance use and focus on everything else. And of course, my patients weren't getting better. Um, and so I, I felt a kind of zeal around wanting to communicate um, this to other psychiatrists. And I can tell you the way that it was received was like a lead balloon. Um, people were not at all interested in hearing that the, self, the self-medication the self hypothesis, that there's essentially no evidence for it. I think that, you know, if we're looking at scientific evidence. And the reason I've so- softened my stance is because I, even though there's no science to support the self-medication hypothesis, it intuitively makes sense that people who have a psychiatric illness would turn to substances to try to ameliorate those symptoms. And and also, there it's not just intuitive, but there's some fundamental truth to that, too. Um, we do know that people who have mental illness have rates of addiction higher than the general population, and that certainly um, the experience of mental health symptoms does become a doorway into which people then become addicted. But I think my main message there is that it's not the only doorway, um, right? There are many other doorways, including just having simple access to drugs, which is a risk factor for addiction. And that also importantly, it's a, 
it's a feed forward cycle that although psychiatric symptoms can contribute to the risk of developing addiction, it's also very true that addiction and substance use is the great mimic and can cause and create psychiatric disorders, and we know that from many different studies. So just trying to raise awareness, acknowledging the role uh, that having a psychiatric disorder plays in terms of the risk of becoming addicted, but understanding that the self-medication hypothesis is really a misnomer because um, it, it doesn't end up helping with those symptoms. That, that um, you, you mentioned very movingly in your book of a personal... Um, problem that you had apparently you you steal chocolate from children is that uh, part of and you talk a little bit about uh you know radical honesty yeah and the power the healing power mm -hmm. the importance mm -hmm. of distinguishing between destructive shame mm -hmm. and pro-social shame mm -hmm. and i can remember california no longer has a physician's health program the way it did a diversion mm -hmm. program i was lucky enough when I developed my addiction, to be able to go to some diversion meetings with other physicians mm -hmm. who are at various stages of their recovery, being monitored by the California Medical Board. That program no longer exists. But I could see so much of what you were describing in your book. Can you tell me a little bit more, define perhaps, and give me an example, maybe a personal example of, of pro-social shame? Yeah. So. Um I think what I was trying to capture there is the, the sort of double-edged sword of shame and how shame can be um, something that perpetuates addictive, maladaptive behavior, but also, very importantly, um, something that can propel us into recovery. I think that the common narrative now is that, you know, sort of shame and stigma in any form is, is bad. And so what I'm trying to say is that it can be bad, but it, it's also a very um, pro-social emotion, right? I mean, it's the way that we recognize when we have deviated from social, social norms and social expectations. Um, and so I, I try to dissect in there, well, what, what are the ingredients of shame that's helpful? And what are the ingredients of shame that, that's not helpful? And ultimately what I concluded is it's not so much the subjective experience of the emotion, which is sort of universal. And by the way, probably one of the most painful emotions that we can experience, shame. But rather how our community receives that experience of shame. And I do hold up Alcoholics Anonymous as one of the organizations that I think has really figured shame out. Because that experience of joining AA is incredibly de-shaming for many people. Um, you know, that knowing that you're not alone, knowing that others struggle in the same way, that you're accepted in the group, and in fact celebrated in the group because you have this problem. And yet at the same time, maybe shame isn't the right word for it, but you know, AA has strict um, behavioral guidelines that they want you to follow, and there's a lot of encouragement, let's say, to participate in the steps, to abstain, to get your 30, 60, and 90-day chips, and people are really motivated in part not to relapse because of the shame that they would experience having to go back and declare themselves as a newcomer. And yet if people do relapse and go back and declare themselves as a newcomer, they're not shunned they're embraced, and their relapse becomes a social good. It becomes something valuable and important for the group, an opportunity for other people to do their 12-step, an opportunity for other people in the group to be reminded of relapse and what early recovery looks like. So there's this very fascinating phenomenon in AA where it's both de-shaming and yet shame operates on this level which is incredibly pro-social because AA has figured out how to make that experience a social good. And when we're talking about social goods or club goods, we're really going into the realm of behavioral economics 
which is, you know, a fascinating literature which looks at what binds people together in groups if there's no monetary reward where the rewards are instead intangible and rely on the active participation of those individuals in the group to create those club goods. Because a group where people are coming together is a group that has club goods, a group where people are not showing up, you lose that participation and you lose those club goods. Yeah, thank you for thank you for putting that into words. I think there are so many things about uh, recovery that about at least twelve step recovery that that you know people don't quite understand. I mean, right now uh, we're in the middle of this terrible, awful opioid epidemic, and absolutely everything should be done to save lives. Even radical things should be tried. I completely agree with that. Um, and you know, the message commonly in uh, publications like the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, uh, especially by uh, a particular department at Harvard, uh, is that we need to get as many people as possible on buprenorphine who have opioid use disorder uh, now. And and as a as a physician, as a uh, public health student, I uh, I certainly see the benefit in that. But you have a very very interesting line um, that. Uh, in your book here, even medications like buprenorphine maintenance treatment may constitute a type of clinical abandonment when social, psychosocial determinants of health are not likewise addressed. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because, because again, the, the, the sea wave, is, the, the, the waves are definitely pushing in one direction right now. Right. Yeah, so again, this is trying to get at some of those, the nuances of the work that we do. And I prescribe buprenorphine. It's absolutely life-saving um, for some of my patients. And I'm really glad that as a, as a discipline, we are moving toward acknowledging uh, the evidence-based utility of buprenorphine in the treatment of people with opioid use disorder. And yet, at the same time, just like we can't, um, you know, arrest our way out of this problem, I also believe that we can't prescribe our way out of this problem. And that really what we're dealing with on many levels is uh, deep-seated uh, social issues that we are trying to uh, treat with, uh, you know, a medicalized approach. And on the one hand, I'm supportive of that. I guess I better be because I'm engaged in that. That's my profession. But on the other hand, I do worry that that will allow us to ignore some of these uh, deeper seated uh, social issues that we're, that we're talking about. What I take on in the book is not just buprenorphine, but also psychotropics more broadly. And if you look at prescribing rates of psychotropics across the world, what you'll see is that more psychotropics are uh, prescribed to people living in poverty than people who are not living in poverty. And that is very concerning for me because I, I am concerned that, um, you know, essentially um, we are trying to numb certain segments of the population so that they're less likely to rise up against the injustices of their circumstances. And so that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at there. Sure. It's a, it's an important subtlety. I think, uh, you know, I'm quite proud of the work we've done at the Meadows to try to integrate buprenorphine into what is otherwise a traditional abstinence-based 12-step trauma-informed multi-modality treatment program um, in a safe way, in a responsible way. I, th I like to think that we're training our patients to be good buprenorphine patients, um, to be able to use the medication as part of a larger program of recovery. Uh, and we've been very, very cautious, very measured, uh, very, um, uh, uh, very careful in the way that we've integrated that into our treatment. You know, it's, it, it's, there's, there's a movement right now. You know, you were in the Nova episode uh, on addiction. I made this film, as you know, uh, and I always ask myself, why doesn't someone come along and make a real film? I mean, put some real budget behind it. Why doesn't Nova on PBS make a, a film talking to the, all the, the best people who understand addiction? And so here comes this film. And I am standing, I could not sit. I had to stand as I watched it in front of the television with a notepad. And they boom, 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 went down all the names exactly as you would come to know them if you were reading the literature. There's Nora Volkoff. There's uh, Robert Malenka. There's uh, Rita Goldstein. Uh, 
Um, they talk about trauma. They go to one of the senior fellows at the Meadows, also known as you know world expert on trauma, Bessel van der Kolk. Um, and when they needed to show a clinician who was able to speak truth to power, um, they showed you. Uh, and I, I found that you know you, know, you were you were very compelling uh, in, in that. Um, but they also showed a gentleman who ran a safe injection site up in Vancouver. And there's this moment, and I really encourage you to watch this show, there's this moment where uh, a person with addiction is preparing to inject and injecting, and this gentleman is sitting with them, attending. Uh, that's a word I think we sometimes lose in medicine, just the power, the healing power of just being with another person. And the look on his face is so beautiful. It is such a combination of of caring and complete lack of judgment and just, you know, I'm I value you as a human being. And he makes an excellent argument for for harm reduction. And I believe in harm reduction. I, I I've I've been very happy to see it grow. When I was um there was no harm reduction in the United States Navy when I developed my addiction. And when my mother found out, uh, and she's a physician as well, she practices up in Alameda, um, and we both went to the same medical school, uh, and she was also at my court-martial. <laughs> uh, not just my, she not only put the hood on me, but she also was at my court-martial. When she heard that I had a, an addiction, she said, we have to get him out of the country. We have to get him out of the United States and get him to Holland where he can use his drugs and not die. And this is why I love my mother. Her default is harm reduction. And I also must say, the idea that there is a circumscribable, set aside, fungible quantity of drugs that could be rightfully labeled mine, I liked that idea very much at the time. Um, but my mother didn't understand that there was something called recovery. Um, and so I wonder, <laughs> when you, when you want to point to people in solid recovery who have changed their lives, who are now using that experience in, in amazing ways to make society better, you look at the collegiate recovery programs. You look at the HIMSS program for commercial airline pilots. You look at professional health programs for nurses and doctors. And the stories are deeply moving and the success rates are wild. But it is a very strict and formal form of recovery. And I, I can't even believe I'm using these words, but I'm gonna quote George Bush here. Um, is there a danger of the soft bigotry of low expectations when we turn to, and you had a very uh, excellent comment on an article advocating for not only decriminalization, but the safe supply of things of heroin. How do we balance those two? Strict, uh, you know, abstinence-based, um, no punches held recovery with compassionate, decent desire to want to save lives? Well, I mean, I, I don't think those need to be competing agendas, right? I think that we can, those agendas can coexist. And the key is that people, that everybody have a choice and we don't have that now. I mean, what we have is that some people have access to some types of uh, pathways and treatment recovery, and other people have access to others. And it's really only a, a privileged minority who has access to the whole menu option. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, har it's harm reduction um, as a form of recovery um, right next to abstinence as a form of recovery and just just making sure that people have access to all the different pathways. Yeah, at different stages perhaps. So maybe mm -hmm. harm reduction, uh, safe injection sites, clean needles um, would be life-saving at one stage of a yeah. person's recovery, but then a different kind of recovery would be better you know, as a person moves into a different stage of their life. In other words, seeing the person's addiction, the entire arc of their addiction from the very worst moments to when they take that degree, you know, uh, in college. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And, but I also, I think um, what, what I try to do, and not always successful, is to try to preserve some, uh, some openness for what we still don't understand. So, for example, you know, 50 years ago, it was, would have been unheard of to consider somebody who had met criteria for an alcohol use disorder that that person could someday go back to drinking in moderation. And yet, we now have evidence showing that a subset of individuals can do that. I have had patients who have been able to do that. So um, I just try to preserve like a certain amount of openness and humility because it, it'll be interesting to see you know, what's coming next. I also think that this idea of moderation, which is in, you know, anathema in some ways and certainly not possible uh, for those with severe addiction, has become very relevant to our lives more broadly because many of us have these minor addictions to things like smartphones or different types of food or sexual addictions, which I think we could all agree would either be impossible to eliminate entirely from our lives um, or that we wouldn't want to, you know, for example, entirely l uh, eliminate sex, sex from our lives. So then the question really does become, how do we moderate consumption? And so that's something that I do explore quite a, quite a bit in the book. And I something I think something is, is worth worth exploring. What you know, how how does moderation happen? What does it look like? Um, and that it's um, it, for some people, it's it's a reasonable consideration. I always think that, you know, when I made the film, I made that goofy little periodic table of the intoxicants. Yeah, and, it's uh, great. Uh, it's uh, sort of, uh, you know, a reminder to myself that I've got a problem with dopamine. I've got a problem with intoxication. And it's the way that I use intoxication to cope with stress, to manage feelings, to regulate emotions, um, to, to not be aware or you know, uh, of, of, of the social interactions and, and obligations that I have in my life. That's what I have a problem with. Uh, and so that, you know, there doesn't seem to be any way to use cocaine like a gentleman, uh, if you read the words in the big book. And, and the big book talks about exactly what you're mentioning. You know, for, those person, for a person who can do the right turnabout and drink like a gentleman, mm. um, we take our hats off to them. Um, uh, I have not been able to do that with, with certain drugs, um, but it's a lifelong struggle, uh, and I keep trying mm -hmm. with, with other things. Mm -hmm. But I, I conceptualize it just as you've written here in your book, um, that I have a dopamine system that's made out of candy glass. Mm -hmm. It works, mm -hmm. but if I overstress it, mm -hmm. uh, then I'm going to have problems. And what's so interesting is, is that it's not just about, you know, things don't feel quite as pleasurable or something like that, it starts to affect the relationships in my life. Right. It starts to degrade my ability to be patient or my mm -hmm. ability to relate to my wife or, you know, how many fists I shake at people, you know, on the, uh, on the freeway, on the drive home. And I find that very fascinating that, right. that by taking care of my dopamine system, yeah. I improve so many other things in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're running out of time here, but I've, I have a question that I've wanted to ask you for a long, long time. Um, before you were a psychiatrist, you were a resident in pathology. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about your interest in pathology? Sure. I mean, that uh, my going into pathology was actually propelled by my going away from psychiatry because my younger sister, when I was a medical student at Stanford, and she was an undergraduate, she was hospitalized for a psychotic manic episode um, while I was on my psychiatry rotation. And so I was actually afraid to go into psychiatry. I felt it was too close to home. So veered in the other direction and went into pathology and then realized after a couple of years that I was not destined to be a pathologist and then went back into psychiatry. So it was a little, it was a little roundabout that I took. Yeah, I feel the same way about OB-GYN. My mother's an OB-GYN doctor. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting because when she uh, stopped her residency at Mount Zion, she was hired by the Oakland Naval Hospital. Ah. Uh, which has since been torn down. And I was an intern at the Oakland oh, Naval yes. Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I had to scrub in with my mother uh, <laughs> when I took my ob <laughs> rotation. And all of our pathology came oh, into dear. the room yes. with us. I'm very happy that that patient was anesthetized. But I think the, the <laughs> surgical techs and nurses are still talking about that. Talk about Freudian. Um, but my interest in, in pathology is, you know, uh, whenever you 
whenever you hear the argument about addiction being a disease or not being a disease, and I have thought about this for the last two decades, mm. ever since I was sitting in a cell, I just I wanted to try to figure this out. Um, uh, very often people sort of stop at some point in the debate and they say, well, we really have to defer to the doctors on what is a disease. And I think if you were getting a bunch of doctors around, they would defer to the pathologists mm -hmm. because pathology is really, that's the study of disease. It's a five-year residency. Uh, it is, they, there's the old saying that, uh, that um, uh, uh, surgeons know nothing but do everything, internists know everything but do nothing, and pathologists know everything and do everything, but one day too late. Um, so there's just a tremendous amount of knowledge. I, I've, always, I've, I've always been fascinated in engaging pathologists. You, you, you ask them, you know, you know, there's such a range of disease. There are so many things that can be diseases, and they get so excited, and they love to tell you about this particular kind of disease. And so my question to you, with your knowledge in pathology, is, um, you know, borrowing from Virchow, and understanding the pathophysiologic definition of disease, what would be your pathologist slash psychiatrist definition, or argument rather, uh, for addiction being a disease? Yeah, so, so my argument would be that addiction is essentially a disease of choice and a disease of learning. And that um, you know our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain right behind our foreheads, the part that we use in delaying gratification, in planning for future consequences, in telling stories, um, is very intimately connected neurobiologically with our limbic brain, which is in the lower brain stem, which is our emotion brain, and is also where we have that pleasure pain balance, um, our reward centers. And these two parts of the brain when everything is working properly, are talking to each other, right? So that reflexive pain, pleasure, response, that really is a reflex. We, we, um, we don't have much volitional control over that, the immediate reactions of the balance to pre pleasure and pain. But we can manage how we respond to those reflexes through our prefrontal cortex and the the wiring that we know exists between those two regions. And what happens essentially uh, in the disease of addiction is that those two parts of the brain stop talking to each other. So there's really a failure of communication between the prefrontal cortex and uh, the reward centers of the brain. So we lose the ability on some level both to learn from experience, to inform our decision making based on experience, and to control our impulses and reflexes. Um, and, and that's what I think the disease of addiction is. One of the things that I talk about in my book um, is that um, the interventions to treat addiction are probably working at the level of reconnecting those pathways between our lower brainstem lizard brain reward centers and our prefrontal cortex. And in fact, um, for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation as applied to the brain to treat addiction uh, does so by trying to wake up the prefrontal cortex and uh, quiet the deeper reward centers or limbic brain. Psychotherapy um, in terms of telling our stories, learning to tell our stories and to tell true stories that keep us accountable to both our present and future selves probably work by reconnecting the neural structures between the reward center and the prefrontal cortex. And I hypothesize in the book that truth telling does that too. Um, that in fact the um, disciplined exertion of trying to tell the truth about everything um, definitely activates the, the prefrontal cortex because truth telling is all about storytelling or not, or the way that we tell our stories, the way that we narrate our lives. And um, that truth telling can actually wake up the prefrontal cortex and connect it to our deeper limbic structures and in that way aid recovery. So that's my, my hypothesis. Sure. So um, do you think things like diffusion tensor MR imaging might be able to elucidate the difference in connection between a disease state that could be called addiction and a non-disease state? I don't even know what that is. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thankfully, I don't have to answer that one. <laughs> well, you know, they say that all MR measures water molecules. <laughs> 
and diffusion tensor imaging measures the travel in three dimensions of water molecules. And since they tend to move along axons ah, and fascicles yes. and things like that, the idea is to try to scan 10,000, 100,000 brains and come up with a basic wiring diagram right. for the brain, the, the connectome project, Neat. right? And if we had that, then we could scan this person's brain and say there's a difference here, a numeric difference, you know, a quantifiable difference, and then we would have met the pathologist definition, right. which is Thomas Zoss's definition, which is a disease is something that is a measurable defect, mm. reproducible defect that leads to symptoms. And I think that uh, it's possible that diffusion tensor imaging may finally be able to parse out those differences. For well, last, there, oh, yeah, oh, I'm please. sorry, I was just going to say there, there is actually already some work underway in this regard. So the work of my colleague at Stanford, Edie Sullivan, she has looked specifically at recovery and brain changes associated with recovery. And what she has found is that there's probably permanent damage, irreversible permanent damage to parts of the brain as a result of severe addiction, but that it, recovery happens by rerouting and creating new neural networks around those um, damaged neural networks, which is fascinating because it both speaks to sort of the permanence or the longevity of this disease, a, a chronic relapsing and remitting phenomenon, but the ability of us to reroute our neural networks around it. But I, I think maybe we've gone on too long. I don't yeah. know. Well, I'll, I'll stop now, but I just, you know, for the last 20 years, I've tried to bring the neuroscience of addiction together with my experience as a person in recovery and also uh, the the beauty of 12-step of recovery, and your book is a major tool to be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank I've already you. given it to I, you. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you.